It isn't obvious to me whether or not Cyberpunk 2077 rolls around in its satire as a means to make the narrative more interesting, or because it doesn't understand the tone it's going for, or because the writing just isn't high enough quality across the board to justify taking itself too seriously too often. If you're here to figure out my general opinion on the game, you can take the title of the video and that last sentence and walk away with relative confidence that you can get the gist of it. For the rest of you who are watching this to enjoy having a long video of something very monotonous on in the background while you do other things, or because you want a deep critique of the mechanics and story associated with this game, there's something very important you should know first. Understand that, unlike my other three reviews on this channel so far, I don't have even a slight grasp on the writing or development culture over at the studio responsible for the game, CD Projekt Red. With Bethesda's Elder Scrolls series, uh, FromSoft's Elden Soulsborne titles, and for some reason, BHVR's DVD, I was able to craft videos that analyzed their respective games within the context of their studio's history. This means that each video didn't just analyze a game in a vacuum, rather, each game was viewed through a lens that provides more context about what the studio was or is attempting. Said lens also lends itself well to a jaded attitude that has experienced the best each studio has to offer, generally, while being sensitive to hiccups or outright lazy design that might infect each title that comes thereafter. I believe, going off of anecdotes based on comment history, that those viewers who saw my Elden Ring video who were FromSoft veterans were able to easily contextualize the arguments in their sources that I made in that video, even if they didn't agree with them. This is in contrast to the viewers of that video who played Elden Ring as their first FromSoft game and, again, judging purely by the comments of that video, had a hard time understanding many of the arguments put forward. Another thing to note is that newbies of the series tended to either love or hate the game outright, whereas FromSoft veterans seem to always have a little more nuance in their relationship with Elden Ring. This is the kind of effect understanding the culture of a studio can have on a player and a playthrough. It forces the mind to dig deeper when trying to get lost in a new game, and whether or not the player wants to begins to develop a more mature relationship with the experience they're having. This isn't a sign of somehow being smarter than a player who's experienced a developer's work for the first time, but it is a sign of being more cultured within the context of a specific work, and as a result, being more cultured in general. Before you click off the video in annoyance with how stuck up that sounds, understand that having a refined taste is part of the textbook definition that characterizes what being cultured means. So yes, it does absolutely apply here. Also understand that my point in all of this is to say that I lack that cultured understanding. If I say something in this review that rubs someone who's played the Witcher series the wrong way, it might actually be because that viewer has access to information regarding what is transpiring in the review that I do not, as I'm reviewing the game in a vacuum, and not through the lens of understanding the developer. I don't believe this is a negative, by the way, anyone can review anything, and if someone with no previous experience with a developer reviews one of their games in a vacuum, they provide an alternate perspective that can be just as valuable as a perspective seeped in a historical context. Not that this principle matters to a high degree anyway, since Cyberpunk is the first game in what will turn into a series not the second or third. Or, in other words, Cyberpunk stands alone as a game, at least enough to make the difference between having played the Witcher trilogy and not having played them as close to non-existent as one could hope for, although not nullified altogether. To compound this with more caveats, I don't think I could have drummed up an idea for a game that is more outside the comfort zone of CDPR than Cyberpunk 2077. I mean, the game is just so dissimilar to the Witcher series that I don't think there is a whole lot they can find common ground with outside of the mature storytelling method CDPR is known for. But then again, I haven't played through the trilogy, so I won't overstep my bounds here and just say that I'm reviewing the game in a vacuum, so don't expect me to open my palms towards CDPR's history as a way to criticize or compliment the game. And with that as preamble, we can begin. Spoiler warning, obviously. We begin our journey with Cyberpunk 2077 in the character creation screen, where we find ourselves choosing our life path. The life path is a representation of V, our main character, and his or her history in life before the main events of the game. Quote, Select V's life path. Some events and dialogue options in the game will be different depending on your choice. This is a fairly weak advertisement to the player as to why choosing any one life path might matter, and, unfortunately, is also pretty generous in describing what might happen in-game since it leaves a lot to the imagination. My imagination, while we're on the subject, brought me to the thought of perhaps being able to squeeze extra cash out of weapons deals with my corpo starting position, or maybe being able to talk my way out of a scrum with some high-level gangsters using my street kid life path. Kind of like how Daggerfall allows the player character to talk enemies into peace using specific language skills like impish or orcish. But no, when the game says it changes dialogue options, 99% of the time the dialogue has zero effect on what's happening in front of the character. It really is there to remind the player that V has experience in X, Y, and Z situations. And... After the characters around you react to what you say, the dialogue options go right back to what they originally were. In short, it makes little to no difference in the outcome of your playthrough. 
This is an example of railroad design and storytelling, where the player is led on a journey that's fixed towards its destination. Now, Cyberpunk has multiple endings, so this analogy doesn't work perfectly, but man, the way you choose to start does not have any effect on the way you choose to finish, which is going to be a plus or a negative, depending on who's playing the game. Pick your life path, and then your sex, and then, well, find me dinner first, am I right, guys? <laughs> the game has nudity, and I disabled it on my first playthrough so that editing wouldn't be a pain in the ass later. No pun intended, you guys can thank me for my sacrifice. Body scars, body tattoos, the hairstyles. I gotta admit, the character creation screen is expansive and looks amazing. Some people don't care about character creation, some people love it, and I sit in between the two. Wherever you find yourself on the yourself customization love spectrum, I think you'd be sorry to not at least appreciate the work that went into making sure each player character looks exactly how you want. Well done, CDPR. We choose our life path, few leave the corporate world with their lives, fewer still with their souls intact. Attributes. 3 body, 5 intelligence, 3 reflexes, 6 technical ability, 5 cool, I'm a fucking loser. We'll go over what these do later, let's get started. Our character, V, is feeling a little unfortunate and vomits into the very futuristic, very inconveniently designed sink. A friend calls, why? It's Jackie Wells, and oh my god, he's talking to us while taking a selfie. I know we only just got into the game, but I got a rag on it for this. This is fucking, uh, this selfie stick thing, this is stupid. This is immersion breaking, this is stupid. For this to be happening, Jackie would have had to set up a camera up and to the right of his face and be actively staring at it directly, directly staring at it for the duration of the conversation. Immediately this shit took me out of my immersion. I mean, look at this. He just stares at you. This happens for every single character that calls you. You pick up and BAM! There's their face just ruining your day. No backgrounds. No nothing. It's not like they've got their laptop set up and are chatting it up with you on a slow day at work. No, it's every time, and it's uncomfortable, and it would never happen, and it's stupid. Did I mention that it was stupid? It can only be disabled for the most minor of characters as well. I'm unsure if CDPR thought we'd be too stupid to recognize the names of each character and put a face to them ourselves, or... If they worked really hard on this feature and just desperately wanted us to see it. Either way, this is a prime example of how more is not always better. In a world that revolves around convenience and futuristic technology, nobody is going to bother having a camera set up 8 inches from their face at awkward angles every time they need to call someone. If you're watching this video and you think that I'm overreacting here, you either haven't played the game or you're lying to yourself about how stupid this is, my god. V gives some light exposition on his role at the corporation Arasaka and Jackie turns off his webcam. After leaving the unfortunately designed bathroom, we encounter one of Cyberpunk's greatest strengths. Passive immersion. It isn't true all the time, but most of the time, Cyberpunk's world design, both in the proper outer world and within traditional indoor levels, keeps a player within the realms of believability or, more accurately, within the grasp of immersion. The architecture all around you feels appropriately designed, while the people who inhabit the world seem to be functioning with some level of autonomy, and in a way that would make sense for people in their positions. Take for example these two NPCs discussing a leak the corporation is experiencing and currently trying to cover up. The way they speak, stand, and are dressed are all conducive to creating a corporate environment. The accessories they sport and the nature of their conversation, too, double down on the sense of fitting realism here. When you're playing cyberpunk, it is something that you'll hardly notice, and that's exactly what you want from a passive immersion tool. And there will be very few times playing 2077 that you'll think to yourself, that shouldn't be there. As a whole, this is something the game does really well. Moving on, we get some expository propaganda about some guy named Subaru Arasaka, and then get a call from our boss, Mr. Jenkins, and oh Jesus, there it is again. Mr. Jenkins scolds us for being an hour late, and then promptly forgets about that seemingly huge issue to mention that Abernathy bitch, who will probably dump it in our laps. Okay, so Frankfurt is a leak the company is experiencing, and we're trying to cover up whatever happened. Got it. But as we'll come to learn, Abernathy is an extremely powerful Arasaka leader who isn't just adjacent to, but actually above Jenkins, so this dialogue is already awkward and doesn't seem to work for me. The way he's talking about Abernathy is clearly meant to be more expository dialogue, so we as the player can make the association between Abernathy and her being an antagonist, but the way he says that Abernathy bitch is not how you talk about someone who has a relatively high amount of fame within your social or professional circle. It's about how you talk about someone who has never, or hardly ever, been mentioned. Imagine you were a boxer with a near-perfect record, and news starts circling of an amateur named Abernathy who keeps KOing experienced fighters. Your trainer might come up to you and say something like, Hey, maybe that Abernathy bitch might give you a run for your money, huh? Now imagine there was a sports player so incredible that they essentially dominated the scene for the last decade. You don't even need to imagine it, just pick one or take a look at the one on screen. If someone turned to you and said, Boy, I wonder if that messy guy will score a goal soon, you'd quickly become annoyed with them because they are either trying to be funny by pretending to be out of touch, or they are, indeed, out of touch. In short, this kind of dialogue just doesn't work with what Jenkins is trying to communicate to us because that Abernathy bitch is one of the most powerful and experienced corpo executives in the entirety of Arasaka, as far as we're aware. 
so we would have been well acquainted with her and her activities within said corporation, especially so since we come later to learn that she ousted Jenkins for a promotion by beating him to it. Why does this matter? Why should I spend any time on this point? Aside from being a minor, easily fixable annoyance so early in the game, the dialogue is unnatural and shows a disconnect between the script writers and the fluidity that should be felt second to second in a game like this. Hell, it just shows bad writing in general, no matter how you frame it. The acting is fine, but the writing is poor. And another form of this problem is seen mere seconds later after leaving the elevator, when we run into an old colleague named Frank. Frank asks us if our boss, Mr. Jenkins, is what everyone says he is. One of the response options to this question is, naturally, to ask what he means by that. But the voice actor delivers the question as though he came up with it on the spot, and not as though someone just asked a question that begs other questions. So instead of saying the equivalent of, well, what are people saying about Jenkins? He says, What's everyone say about Jenkins? What's everyone say about Jenkins reads and sounds like we're on an intel gathering mission revolving around a guy named Jenkins who we know nothing about. So either the voice actor for V wasn't able to deliver the right kind of line needed for the take, or, more likely, the writers who scripted the question threw the data all the way down the pipeline until it reached the voice actor, and somewhere, the communication required to understand the nature of the question broke down. I'm not sure how something like this happens, but honestly, I really doubt V's voice actor wasn't capable of delivering that kind of line, and I'd sooner put my money on poor communication from the writers or some other middleman within the development system. Whatever the case is, it's a sign of poor game development anyway, so there's no excuse. Especially since this is not five minutes into an open world game where dialogue takes up 50% of what the player is doing. A bad start from a dialogue perspective and a sign of what's to come. We meet up with Jenkins in his office. He's currently spectating a vote with the European Space Council and tells us to have a seat. Uh, the European Space Council is exactly the kind of title for a government agency that helped to name this video. What's big, important, and governed space? The European Space Council, obviously. And what kind of currency does Cyberpunk 2077 have the player use? Dollars? Euros? Pounds? No, of course not. The player uses Euro dollars, really just to show that the American dollar is no longer the global standard, which is fine. But I'll just say I'm really thankful everyone in the game refers to them as Eddies, because seeing the word Euro dollar everywhere feels like a half-assed nickname that stuck around for way too long, and is now the common standard as an ironic joke. Like, they would have just named them dollars or euros. Alright, I'm losing most of your interest here, so I'll digress. In short, this space council is going to vote against Arasaka's interest in maintaining a license for bases within outer space due to whatever information leaked in the Frankfurt situation. We would have lost the license, now we gained a week. That's a win. And so Jenkins who's tasked with dealing with the whole fuck up, simply decides to assassinate a group of Space Council members, effectively delaying the vote. The situation is multifaceted due to Jenkins' rivalry with that bitch Abernathy. Apparently, Abernathy is using this whole problem to aim the blame at Jenkins, which would ultimately lead to his ousting from the corporation. So not only are the two executives trying to solve the Frankfurt issue, but they're trying to do it while getting ahead of each other. In Abernathy's case, the strategy employed is to take this apparent catastrophe of a leak and blame Jenkins for being unable to solve the problem. In Jenkins' case, the strategy employed is to simply cause chaos and disrupt the pipeline of effective business so that Abernathy can't simply kill Jenkins, since she needs him to fix the problems that he is purposely creating. This is an exciting plan to walk in on as the player. After all, Jenkins works in counterintelligence alongside V, a segment of the corporation that would probably be involved in covering up the assassination of important figures of government like the ones who sit on the European Space Council. And after Abernathy comments on how expensive it's going to be to cover up that Jenkins classic, it's clear to me that buying time is Jenkins' primary concern for the sake of his own life, as opposed to simply fixing the problem that he will inevitably be blamed for. Despite the problems seen on a micro level, I think this opening sequence of events for the corporal lifestyle is extremely well written on a macro level, and, after playing the game long enough, reveals itself to be an effective lens into the minutia of Arasaka's internal functioning and how that affects the greater world. The only problem I have with it is the way this macro writing doesn't seep into the gameplay at all. Take for instance this piece of dialogue we share with Jenkins after he assassinates the ESC members. Before he reveals the next part of his plan, which is to send us to ice Abernathy, he asks if we understand the position he's in, and what we think we should do about it. We're met with two opposing options, both contradicting one another, and yet both options lead to the same response from Jenkins. Nothing in the game changes, nothing in the game even acknowledges that we were either aggressive against Abernathy or apathetic towards Jenkins' eventual demise, despite those two details being extremely important to how Jenkins should react here, and yet... You have to defend yourself. Remind Abernathy you're not her doormat. You're right. Smack her once, but hard. She'll respect you. 
Seems we see eye to eye on this issue. There's not much you can do. She's got the Night City board on her side. If she wants you out, well, you understand. I do. Seems we see eye to eye on this issue. It seems small, but if you're playing this game for the first time, you feel like it's cool the game offers you this choice. But it's really all smoke and mirrors. There is no real choice here. Nothing you say matters. No attitude you have about Jenkins affects anything, even in a minor way. That is a severely limiting attribute. A role-playing game like this one shouldn't be so quick to advertise. And if it's not a role-playing game, it's still a story game with multiple endings. So if you're going to pretend to have choices, actually have choices. Moving on, Jenkins gives us some cash, asks us to build a team of people who we trust to do the hit against Abernathy, and sends us on our way to meet up with whomst of we please. And with whomst we pleased is either one of the most enjoyable or one of the most annoying characters in the game, Jackie Wells. Annoying or enjoyable really depends on what the developers need him to act like at the time to facilitate the story. But we'll get to that later. Our friend from earlier, Jackie. You remember the one with the selfie? Yeah, that's the one. See, you can even remember his face because you saw it when talking to him over the inconveniently designed sink. Quite the useful feature. I like Jackie. He's funny, he's charming, he's good at killing people, and he doesn't seem like the kind to keep many secrets. The whole kazoo. He also denies our request to use him as the solo for a crew against Abernathy. Which seems problematic, but is also actually fine, since Abernathy sends her people to kill that baby in the crib, so to speak. All of the info regarding the hit is taken, and the only thing that stops the corpos from killing us is Jackie. It goes without saying, too, that Jenkins' life is forfeit, given Abernathy being ahead of his game. She must have a plan of her own to take care of that space cancel fiasco. Uh, small point, but when the corpos ask for the shard containing the job data, you have to give it to them, but they still call it a smart choice which feels like a bit of a slap in the face by the developers, but fuck it. Jackie somehow scares the corpos away by reminding them that they're in a bar with a bunch of junkies who, let's be real, aren't going to do a single fucking thing if they start shooting, so how that scare tactic works, I have no idea, but fuck it. We start having withdrawals from the corpo tech that we've lost access to, and Jackie points out that this is the best thing that could ever happen to us. I agree with him. I like Jackie. Begin the montage of us starting our new corporate free life. Enjoy the montage in the background while I talk about the structure of this video so far. Isn't it boring? Isn't it annoying that I'm just relaying to you all of the things that happened in my playthrough without any real structure but to follow the developer's story progression? I'm sure many of you listening to this were probably immediately turned off by my pattern here, and I don't blame you at all. That same boring pattern found in this video is found in Cyberpunk's opening. No variation. No freedom, no ability to cause chaos or to shove it up your superior's asses, nothing of the sort. It's a one-way train that moves at a snail's pace and holds your hand all the while. That's true for this opening sequence, it's true for the mission with Jackie just after it, it's more or less true with the region-locked introduction featuring the rotund fixer, the meet and greet with the soon-to-be-dead white girly of thievery and romantic interest number one, and it's true for the whole kerfuffle regarding the yet-to-be-discussed Arasaka job. And it is for all of these reasons that I cannot write this video in any other way. You see, the railroading and handholding opted for here is a sacrifice, I believe, that CDPR has made for the sake of storytelling. That is, if you set up the whole collection of things that must happen for the rest of the story to follow, then you make it much easier to write the remaining story. For example, CDPR can write missions and future dialogue knowing that we gave the chip to Abernathy, or that Jenkins dies, or that Jackie said no to the hit job, etc, etc. It just makes the setup easier, because they know we aren't going to kill Abernathy's goons and keep the shard. And they know we won't kill Abernathy. And they know we won't immediately pop Jenkins through the skull for being annoying. And they know these things because they force us to set up the story for them. This is an approach that sacrifices freedom for easier storytelling, and that is a sacrifice that I cannot commend CDPR for making. I do not feel the starting equipment and dialogue that changes throughout the game are worth the absolute snooze fest that is dicking around for 20 minutes at the start of the game. And honestly, the two-hour minimum investment to get through the actual introduction, which pretty much ends with the Relic's revival of V, feels like a narrative risk that hurts the player experience more than it enhances the story itself. So you can take everything I've said, with regards to the underwhelming setup and introductions, and attach it to everything that takes place before Dexter Deshaun's death. Alright, with that out of the way, uh, you and I are going to take a break and go over some fundamentals. Gunplay, roleplaying, looting, character progression, skills, perk trees, armor, and so much more. The gunplay is hyper-satisfying hyper satisfying. It doesn't matter what kind of weapons you use or what your playstyle is, clearing out a group of gangsters is always worth doing if you like having fun, and is easily the most consistent part about Cyberpunk's foundations. Everything you do in the game revolves around one of two things, dialogue or combat. And the gunplay, which makes up roughly one third of the combat triangle, is about as buttery smooth as I can see as possible. This is doubly so when paired with the finesse of the movement system incorporated into Cyberpunk's skeletal 
makeup. Moving around, whether stealthy-like or chaotically, is responsive, consistent, and pretty much always functions to the benefit of the player. That is, you are never fighting with the control schemes, they always work as intended. This means that the gunplay in Cyberpunk is paired nicely with a movement system that allows for action scene-esque fight styles and keeps the game cinematic, even during unscripted moments of chaos. And after dispatching foes, you'll have the dopamine hit of looting the battlefield. Let's talk about that. Cyberpunk opts for a very The Division looting experience, and honestly, I kind of despise it. The feeling of picking up 20 different weapons after every encounter and searching through them to find that there's a submachine gun with like plus 0.5% DPS before switching them out and stripping the rest for upgrade materials feels gamey. Like mobile phone gamey. The feeling of getting your first rune semi in OSRS outperforms the feeling of any upgrade in Cyberpunk 2077 because getting upgrades in Cyberpunk is less like jumping up in performance and more like inching closer to your ultimate endgame weapon, which you'll likely craft yourself. This is because Cyberpunk asks that you pay attention to the extremely silly amount of randomized loot on the ground to facilitate minor upgrades instead of asking for your time up front in the form of skill training or rare drops with more significance. And what am I talking about? Well, here's an example. In Skyrim, when you frag an orc carrying a two-handed Arsimor sword, you know what kind of weapon you'll be able to loot from the guy. You might pick up some gold he was carrying, but you'll probably not pick up his weapon unless it's a direct upgrade to your, say, iron two-handed sword. And once you do pick up his weapon, you won't waste time picking up that same weapon again unless you want to sell it and have the carrying capacity to do so. This is because every Orsimer two-hander is identical to the next, unless it has either been enchanted or if you go out of your way to refine it by the smithing skill. In Cyberpunk, I'm fairly certain that almost all of the weapons are identical to other weapons of the same name, but since loot is leveled to the player after the 2.0 update, you pretty much have to check them all to make sure different weapons don't start jumping up in DPS as you level. There will be almost no situations where you go to kill a group of baddies and then walk away absolutely positive that they don't have anything useful you could use. And anyway, you have to collect them all to make sure you have enough upgrade materials for future weapons regardless. All of this to say that Cyberpunk just throws loot at you and it feels arcadey and it feels goofy and I really do hate it. I like loot to either be recognizably discardable and junk or new and intriguing. But after a few hours into Cyberpunk's gameplay loop, you will find yourself seeing the same weapons everywhere and all the time, which means you will be compelled to pick up everything while not being sure if they are upgrades or not, which means you have to stop interacting with the seamless gunplay to scroll through your UI checking if the fucky fuck green pistol you just found has a plus 5 DPS increase over your current weapon. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I understand that looter shooters are popular for a reason, and if you like this kind of thing, I'm happy for you, but I just can't bring myself to compliment it. I can swing with it because Cyberpunk is good enough to ask that of me, but I'd rather not, you know? I don't care for it in the Division 1 or 2, and I don't care for it in Cyberpunk. And this kind of ties in with character progression. Aside from gaining more power directly through item upgrades, which I just went over, the player has the responsibility of leveling their character through skill and attribute trees. The attribute perk trees in Cyberpunk are exactly what they sound like, trees of bonuses that provide buffs to the player character. They all pertain to certain aspects of the game and help to funnel the player into a combat archetype. For instance, players who use tech weapons often will probably find themselves being funneled into the technical attribute tree, while sneaky beakies will opt for the cool tree. There is enough variation in the perk trees that someone using tech weapons on one playthrough might opt for the body or reflex trees on another playthrough, even if they use the same weapons through each. The trees mesh very well with each playstyle, pretty much all of them have something to offer and help to not only buff up the character's stats, but change the way a player might approach different situations. That's exactly the kind of design I like from these types of perk trees. Forego too many perks that increase damage in a boring way, and instead introduce perks that help the player when approaching problems from entirely different angles. I like it. I cannot give this kind of credit to the skill trees, which reward passive behavior in fairly vague ways. For instance, getting stealth kills grants XP in the shinobi tree, but so does vaulting and dashing, so whether or not you play a stealth character, you're going to be leveling the stat and gaining its benefits. You probably won't be maxing it without playing purely stealth, but you'll benefit from it all the same. This is true for all of the skill trees. They all level passively, unless you really try to not play the game in certain ways, and the rewards they give you are about as just okay-ish as the attention you put into the skill trees is intense. That is to say, not at all. You don't really pay attention to the skill trees, and the skill trees do not pay much attention to you, they're just kind of there. It feels like every skill tree is the speed stat from Oblivion and Morrowind, and that whether or not you'll want to, you'll be leveling them, so you really don't need to pay attention to it at all since the benefits they give are passive. A wasted opportunity, I think, since heavily defining the ways these skills gain XP could limit the skills players are able to level on one playthrough, thus allowing their respective stat buffs and rewards in general to be buffed for the playstyles that do, indeed, associate themselves to said skills. Last but not least, armor. 
This topic might sound like it belongs in the same category as loot or character progression, all but for one simple fact, and that is the 2.0 update. Most of you probably already know this, but CDPR came back in during Phantom Liberty's release and reworked much of the game. Enemy scaling, loot scaling, certain aspects of the main storyline, crafting, perks, skills, attributes, the whole thing reworked, all of it. And pretty much strictly speaking, those reworks have been nothing but beneficial to the overall experience afforded by the game. It's cleaner, the perks are more intuitive, and also less shallow, and they include vehicle buffs, which uh, I don't know who the fuck is using that, but at least it's there, you know. The 2.0 update also reworked armor, which is why I think the topic of protective stats works to represent the 2.0 update as a whole. Before the reworks, armor was gained primarily through clothing, which meant you were tied down between the age-old question of fashionscape versus protection. If you wanted to play at higher difficulties, that meant you had to opt for protection. And that meant you looked like a fucking asshole. Seriously, going through the game and swapping out clothes so that you could gain minimal stat bonuses was a hassle. It made you look stupid, and it was plainly, bluntly, unfun. After the 2.0 update, the majority of your character's armor and stat bonuses come from implants, which was a system most players already enjoyed using to begin with, and had embedded itself in all of the 2077 archetypes, since it buffs and changes a character's playstyles in extremely significant ways. And it's thanks to the 2.0 update that armor, as it stands, is actually a stat that doesn't cause the fashion scape to suffer and works naturally with the attribute, skill, and implant system. All of this to say that I think CDPR deserves a heap of credit for breaking their backs over the 2.0 update. It's free, it's almost strictly a plus in all ways, more on the potential negatives later, and it was expertly implemented. GG CD. All right, did you enjoy that break? Because we're moving back into the story now, and this next chapter of the video will be all things introduction, the beginning and end of Dexter Deshawn. Mr. Deshawn represents the middleman of Night City's crime business. That is, he's a fixer, someone who fixes jobs together and keeps everyone, from client to crew, honest on the payments and work completion. For us, he's the first fixer we're allowed to interact with, although he's not the first fixer our character, V, has been introduced to, as made evident by the work he's done in association with Wakako Okada. Dexter Deshawn is written and acted to display all things you'd associate with Cyberpunk 2077's crime lords. He's clean, smooth-talking, has gold plating on his tech implants, and is written to be cool-headed and reasonable. In my opinion, this character functions as a perfect doorway into the rest of the game, for it is through him that we begin to learn about how organized the crime of Night City really is, and how realistically some of the characters throughout the game's shenanigans behave. Night City is written to be a chaotic, disgusting, expensive, crime-ridden, drug-infested location with pretty much nothing worth saving. If a bomb dropped and erased it from the face of the earth, the world would only be improved. It's a dystopian piece of fiction that we're lucky doesn't actually exist, except for all the places where it does. Mr. Deshawn, in contrast, actually seems like a fairly level kind of man. Someone you could enjoy lunch with and walk away from the ordeal feeling like you spent some time with someone who adds value to your life. He's got wit, he's calm, and enjoy some seconds spared for the odd philosophical discussion. His voice actor does a wonderful job at carrying these attributes to the point where Mr. Deshawn remains a fairly memorable character despite not having so much screen time. Remember, this is still technically what I'd call the introduction. From the point you meet Mr. Deshawn, which is right after completing a railroad admission for Mrs. Okada, you are tied to the Watson district of Night City. Any attempt to leave will result in the game telling you that you need to turn back and that there isn't anything there for you. Yet. What? The decision to lock down Watson has a lot of theories placed on it. Some players say that it's because a certain Saburo Arasaka is coming to visit, and his corp wants him safe, as safe as possible. While others say it's simply because there's a lot of crime in the area, and the mayor is trying to flex while approaching re-election season. Now, the real reason, of course, is that the developers don't want you getting involved with the rest of the game before stealing the relic since almost all of it is written with Johnny Silverhand in mind. No pun intended. Again, this goes back to what I said about forcing the story to start in a certain way so that the rest of the game is easier to account for in the writing room. If we try to leave Watson and attempt to do a mission that was written to have Johnny commenting on what's taking place, it would be extremely jarring to have him appear without having first implanted the relic in our skull. Obviously. This means that CDPR could either write every single mission that has Johnny involved to have a potential secondary scripting that doesn't include Johnny, or what they actually did, just don't let us interact with missions that have Johnny involved before stealing the Reddick. Reddick. <laughs> or what they actually did, just don't let us interact with missions that have Johnny involved before stealing the Relic. When looking at it that way, it's hard for me to criticize CDPR for limiting our freedom here, since it would be asking way too much of anyone who isn't superhuman to put that much work into a game just on the off chance that we didn't want to do the first part of the main quest. Still, I hate this kind of thing. 
we'll move beyond it. I just wanted to touch on 2077 being very clearly a game that puts the whims and wishes of the silly little role player beneath the wisdom of the ever-present main quest. We meet with Dexter, strike a deal with him, and we let our friend, you remember him, it's Jackie Wells, that will be doing a heist mission for the man. Small note, Dexter asks us if we'd rather die young with a speedy speedy cool guy life or die old with slow slow lame safe caution guy life. The choice you make as an answer to his inquiry has almost no effect on the gameplay in the future, but is really there to cement the philosophies found in 2077. First, he's connected us with a client who's interested in obtaining a relic, a piece of tech that allows for the mind of a person to be transferred into an engram, thus allowing for the pseudo form of immortality. Second, as a necessary step in stealing the relic, we have to obtain a little robot called a flathead. Uh, the flathead is a piece of narrative and gameplay crutch that I'll be referring to as a cyberpunk thingy moving forward. Well, what I mean by that is the flathead only exists to give the player a reason to interact with the new corporation and gang, since we have to go through both to receive it. I'm not saying that the flathead existing is a problem, but when you do finally get to stealing the relic, it becomes apparent by the absolute snooze fest that is using it, that CDPR only included it to facilitate world building. Again, in principle, that isn't just fine, but a great way to flesh out the world. My only problem here is that they didn't really care to make the flathead itself feel like it wasn't something scraped together by the development team. It's insanely boring to use, feels stuffed in as an afterthought despite how much trouble you go through to claim it, and acts as a reminder once you see it for what it actually is, that there are some cyberpunk thingies that will ultimately exist solely to take you out of your immersion so that CDPR can have an easy way to push more story. Moving on with the story, just kidding story for a minute, let's talk about distractions and diversions. Distractions and diversions are a mechanic in video games that function to add flavor to the main course of the game. The term, as I use it, comes from RuneScape 3, which features distractions and diversions in the form of extremely random, neat little, uh, oh cool, I didn't know I could do that, moments that function to give you a natural, often very much needed break from the grind. In 2077, despite CDPR's best efforts, the distractions and diversions are at best mediocre and at their worst actually distracting in a way that insults the titular philosophy of their inclusion. Cyber psycho sightings and CDPR scanner hustles make up the majority of the side work you're going to be doing in game. Cyber psycho sightings are easily the stronger of the two activities. In them, you act as a sort of hitman going to take out someone who's been so severely altered by extreme implant modifications in the society they're in that they've lost their minds and have become ultra violent. Kill the cyber psychos, collect your reward, repeat. Bonus points for capturing them alive. In theory, these encounters act as a way for the developers to show the player what's possible with certain implants, weapons, explosives, and quick hacks. Uh, in reality, these encounters are slightly more difficult scanner hustles. That is to say they are short-lived, mostly repetitive, and are done on a whim while the brain is AFK for the sake of abating your malevolent completionist addiction. Speaking of which, Scanner hustles are the exact same thing, but instead of fighting a somewhat unique opponent, you fight hordes of gang members that are all placed in fixed locations, causing a ruckus. The fights aren't really difficult or engaging in any meaningful way that isn't inherent to the fluidity of 2077's base combat mechanics, and the rewards are just more cash. These scanner hustles are placed all over the map, are present in the same places through each playthrough, and are always active until you clear them out. In essence, the difference between the cyber psycho sightings and the scanner hustles, which, again, is what you will mostly be doing when not engaged with the main story, is the novelty of fighting a somewhat unique opponent as opposed to generic gang members. If it weren't for the base combat mechanics of the game, which as we've said are excellent, you'd be well pressed to even come across one of these things, let alone clear them after maybe 10 hours of playtime. Okay, back to the story. Remember the relic we're supposed to steal? We go to steal it. Jack eats shit and dies. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care at all. I'm actually pretty happy about it. Want to know why? Because Jackie, before the heist, is a pretty cool character. I enjoy him. As soon as the prep work for the heist is underway, he immediately becomes fucking insufferable. The devs start really leaning into the fact that he's, like, not cut out for big-time crime. He's obnoxious, he isn't very intelligent, he lacks a sort of professionalism needed for the type of job we're doing. I'd argue he is straight-up fucking useless during the heist. He contributes nothing except to distract the soccer guards while we try and get our camera to stop bugging out so we can actually see what's happening. I like the idea, by the way, that instead of recognizing this bug for what it is, some players probably made it headcanon that Arasaka was quick hacking our vision or something, making it all sorts of terrible to look at. Anyway, Jackie dying is played up as this moment that's supposed to be heartbreaking, and for V as a character, I'm sure it is, but oh my god, I couldn't care. Could you? Could anyone? The devs are playing against themselves here, really. On the one hand, the whole heist is far too long in the making for what should be considered, if you remember, still the introduction but at the same time doesn't give enough room to flesh Jackie Wells out enough for this moment to have the payout it was looking for. Not by a long shot. 
And honestly, I don't think there was much to be done about that since Jackie looks... <laughs> oh my god, I'm dying. And honestly, I don't think there was much to be done about that since Jackie looks to be a fairly one-dimensional character. We feel some loyalty to him because he is loyal to us. And that loyalty is tried uh, not just by his incompetence, but also because the writers chose to make him puppy dog status to try and tug at the heartstrings as he neared his end. This had the inverse effect of making him annoying, which means the attempt at making his death sad didn't work. Moving on. The relic basically needs a host to live in, otherwise it overheats. So naturally we stick it in our heads to save the product. We tell an AI to take Jackie's body back to his mother, which is played off as a, his family would wanna have him kind of thing, but I think is ultimately uh, horrifying in its own way. And then we make our way to Dexter Deshawn. Now, news of our exploits has gotten around. The Emperor of Arasaka was assassinated by his son during the heist with us present. And the blame for the crime is being put squarely on the shoulders of whoever stole the relic, which is us. Dexter knows this. He sees the writing on the wall and in a very panicky way, lets us know that it's time to skip town. But first, we gotta wash our face. Wink, wink. We wash our face so as to enable our scripted cyberpunk thingy, knocking out against our will, fucky fuck railroad. Listen, I hate this. Hate, hate, hate this kind of thing. Taking agency away from the player so that we can be forced to get knocked out by an NPC. Stop doing this. Every time I'm playing a game and I walk through some door or enter a new area and my character just starts moving forward without my input, I'm like, oh, great, we're, we're about to get knocked out for sure. It happens every time. It's like watching a movie and then hearing the Wilhelm scream. Just stop. Stop doing this. It's jarring. If you need to have the player get knocked out for some reason, do it naturally. Have an NPC fire an in-game projectile that knocks people unconscious or have someone who is unreasonably strong knock us out with some punches. Don't take control away from the player and create a cinematic, totally not foreseen, time to go unconscious moment that the player is forced into. Ah, I hear you say, but what if the player finds a way to circumnavigate the sleepy dart, an unreasonably strong opponent? Then they wouldn't be knocked out. Good. Cool, let the players who find out how to do that experience the game without having to sit through the following cutscenes. Have the reason Silverhand begins taking over our minds be that the chip was damaged during the heist and started the transformation process before its host was dead. Have Takamura find us by just calling us after a few in-game days. Nothing major needs to change. Just stop taking my controllies away, please. Anyway, so yeah. <clears throat> we get knocked out. Dexter Deshawn pops a cap in our ass to cover up the loose ends, naturally, and is promptly found out by Takamura, an agent of Arasaka Corp. Tuck uses Dexter to find our risen from dead body, kills Dexter, and tries to get us to safety while Arasaka Corp chases it down. We should talk about suspension of disbelief for a moment. Uh, suspension of disbelief, as it pertains to the combat in this game, is fairly easy to abide by. Sometimes you'll mag dump rounds into an enemy's face who just doesn't seem to care, and the reasoning is that, well, they have implants in their hands and legs that give them armor stats, so they take more rounds to kill. And like I said, it's an action game. It's chaotic and it's wild. It's really not hard to just accept that and enjoy your time playing cyberpunk. But the corporations, okay? They're supposed to be the all-powerful, all-knowing, larger-than-life superpowers of the world. The militaries, the peacekeepers, the gangs, none of them have anything on the corporations and their resources of net runners, weaponry, and futuristic tech. And yet I'm supposed to believe that Arasaka, after having found my position in this car, after engaging with me in combat, after wrecking my ride, isn't capable of taking me out. Me, the guy who was just bested by Dexter Deshawn not five minutes ago is now evading Arasaka Corp. Even with Tox help, Mm, you know, it's just one of those things. It's just one of those things. I can play the game without complaining about it. It doesn't really detract from the action or mechanics of the game. And I'm not going to pretend like for the average person it's going to matter, but we should be absolutely fucked at this point. It isn't even a matter of not being leveled enough or having a ride or being able to hide properly. We are just absolutely fucked. Arasaka knows who we are. They know where we are. They know we're in cahoots with the personal bodyguard of the now assassinated Subaru Arasaka. The game should end right here. Roll credits, we're dead. There is no distance we can run, no physical area that we could hide in that will outperform the level of intel and resources that Arasaka has access to. We're dead, we're fucking dead. That's what should be the case. In the reality of the game, the supposedly all-powerful corporation that absolutely knows who we are is basically relegated to hoping they cross paths with us again to fight us they are cut down into an enemy that is hardly worth fearing at all, really. Even if you walk straight into their agents in the open world, they just refuse to recognize you. I guess their tech can't outperform the facial obscurity that comes with the stuff we were forced to have gifted to us from Vic in the intro. Quite convenient, eh? We escape by being dragged to Vic's place, thus implicating him quite selfishly in our crimes. He saves us, explains that the relic is stuck in our heads and is slowly replacing our mind entirely and cannot be removed without killing us. Misty drops us off at our, oh, 
Uh, Misty is Jackie's girlfriend. She's pretty torn up about his death, as you can imagine. I still don't give a shit. Anyway, we talk to her about Jackie for a bit. It's underwhelming. <laughs> and we fall asleep, dreaming into the next chapter of our video, which is concerned with Johnny Silverhand. In narrative terms, Johnny Silverhand is what I'd call a story-based hypercarry. Without him and the performance given by Keanu Reeves, there is very, very little to keep the game interesting outside of the bigger moments. Johnny Silverhand is the persona that our mind is being overwritten by. He was an anti-corpo musician who embedded himself into legend by dying for the sake of committing terrorism against Arasaka Corp. In a way, he died for a cause that puts humanity before any entity that can embody a corporation. And I respect that. After committing said terror, Arasaka captured him and used a piece of tech called Soul Killer on him. Uh, Soul Killer essentially copies the mind of whatever host it's used on and turns it into raw data. That raw data was then uploaded to the relic which we then stole and implanted to our heads to prevent from overheating, and there you go. That's how Johnny Silverhand ended up in our heads, slowly replacing our mind. Now, the game is not time-gated or anything like that, so the dire need to get the relic removed before Johnny overtakes V isn't a real pressure throughout a playthrough. Time passes in-game, but for the sake of the narrative, time only really passes when you complete missions, because those are the only triggers that can make V's mind suffer the consequences from the relic overriding his mind. I think this is a real shame. Because having checkpoints in time based on in-game hours could be a cool way to pressure the player even further when making moral decisions. Do you really want to spend time trying to help this vending machine? Or do you want to get through the main quest to see if you can erase the relic before Johnny overtakes V? Towards the late game, this could open up some interesting decision making that varies from playthrough to playthrough, depending on how much time has been spent in-game. This would also open up opportunities to add randomized mechanics associated with Johnny's skills. That is, after two weeks passing game, for instance, regardless of what you're doing, your damage with pistols increases 20%, since that's the weapon of choice for Johnny. But your tech abilities are decreased, since Johnny was probably not very tech savvy. These effects could be reverted through the use of the pills that Misty gives you, which could then increase their intrinsic value to the narrative, aside from being momentary options to get Johnny to shut up every now and then. Morwen had a miniature form of this via the corpus disease that would continually weaken your character's stats until healed, and it provided first-time players with a huge sense of urgency in finding the cure. Once you realize that the only thing triggering changes in V's mind is actively participating in the story, you're actually given motivation to stop playing through the story, since you might actually like V and want to keep him around. In a game that's narrative-based, having motivation to not play it is rather counterintuitive, and I don't think CDPR intended for this to be a factor in players' decision-making when running through it, but it is there. Whether or not it'll matter to each individual is up for debate, uh, but what can't be denied is that there is no source of urgency to complete the main story aside from maybe trying to finish the game so you can move on. Despite all of this, what I found when playing 2077 is that Johnny can add a lot to a scene by doing very little. His charisma, his dialogue, his delivery, his moral compass all play a role in providing meaningful insight to the situations V finds himself in. If V is in a tussle with some gangsters and religious folk, Johnny will have something to say about that. If V is progressing the main story and is about to make a huge decision for himself, Johnny will have something to say about that. This is doubly interesting because after a certain point, Johnny becomes just as much V as V as Johnny. So it isn't really Johnny butting in and giving V his two cents, but sharing his opinion on what decision is best for himself, since the two are one and the same. Johnny Silverhand is a character that is usually bereft of a cunning image or attitude, but shows reliable thought process and logic through his dialogue, whether he's talking about something mundane or massively important. He's obviously one of the biggest pieces of the narrative, but luckily is also a joy to listen to most of the time, at least for me. Without him, or without such a charming performance by his actor, I probably wouldn't have been motivated enough to make this video or even finish the game, really. Uh, now let's catch up on the story. I'll be brief. Takemura, the ex-Arasaka bodyguard, begins working with us to prove his innocence and to incriminate Yorinobu. Who, if you remember, is the one who de-escalated the problems with his father permanently, kinda. Naturally, V is trying to find someone, anyone, who can help solve this particular issue involving Johnny and the relic stuck in his head. Since Arasaka is the corp that invented the relic, working to get closer to people in the corporation is in V's best interest. Ultimately, this means that working with Takemura is also in V's best interest, and the two make an unlikely combo. Takemura is a character that was built from the get-go, both in-game and, I'm willing to bet, from the writing room, to be a serious character. So the fact that there are glimmers of silliness in him is something I appreciate. That's just a small personal note, we're not going to analyze it, but if you've played the game I'm sure you can understand what I'm talking about. The two begin working together. This involves making a plan to get in contact with the neutral Arasaka employees who are willing to work with Takamura to get to the truth of the Emperor's death. For V, this means doing what Tak asks of him while also trying to find experts on the relic to help him out. 
The expert that comes across is one Anders Hellman, who can both offer V advice on how to fix his life-threatening problem and can act as a witness for talk. But just before going after Hellman, a few things need to happen. First, V tracks down some leads on Evelyn Parker, who was the client, if you remember, on the initial relic heist. As it happens, she was contracted by the Voodoo Boys, a gang, who intended to obtain the relic for themselves. Evelyn intended to double-cross them and was subsequently punished by being sold. Eventually, into a sort of slavery. She was to be an actress in a snuff film. Which is tough, but V, along with Judy, bless her face, save her before she dies in said film. After doing so, V is led to the Voodoo Boys. Long story short, the gang is trying to breach the Black Wall, a sort of protection against rogue AIs in the digitalized world, or something. And that leads us to Alt. Alt Cunningham was a woman who wrote the programming for the original build of Soul Killer. Originally, her work simply allowed users to explore databases independent from their body. ITS, the corp she was working for at the time, pushed her developments further into later builds, ultimately becoming the soul killer weapon, or tool. Vying for this power, Arisaka kidnapped Alt and forced her to recreate the build from scratch. Wary of the fact she needed a way out of her kidnapping, Alt programmed with the intention of using her build to free herself by taking over Arisaka's defense systems before re-uploading her consciousness back into her body. She actually manages to do this almost perfectly before Johnny, actual pre-death Johnny, comes in guns a-blazing to save her. With explosives and aggressive gunfire, Johnny Silverhand assaulted the tower Alt was held in and managed to break into the office where she was actively making her own escape. Since he arrived at that time, that exact time, it became very fucking important that he didn't do anything stupid, like unplug Alt before she had a chance to re-upload herself after securing her safety. Like, even the one guy who knows anything about what's happening is like, okay, seriously, don't touch her. <laughs> and Johnny just shoots him and promptly unplugs her. Like, dude, Johnny is a fucking dumbass. It's detailed in a canon story that Alt is actually screaming from the digitalized world not to do anything as Johnny shoots the one guy who could clue him in on what's happening. In horror, she is forced to watch helplessly, screaming to no avail, as Johnny irrationally unplugs her warm body with her consciousness still uploaded on the net, effectively killing her. The result is the creation of a replica Alt Cunningham, which has all the same habits, thoughts, and skills as Alt, but not the soul. And now we've come to one of the main reasons I believe Cyberpunk 2077 as a game lacks depth. Alt Cunningham. Alt's digital form is not a god. It isn't a being of higher intelligence or something that's transcended human behavior, it's literally just Alt. But when you meet her, it's clear that the writers wanted her to be something more than what she is, and the way they show that is clearly lacking in the uh, makes sense department. That sucked. Instead of just being Alt, the developers sought to depict her digitalized form in some special way. The story doesn't call for this, the narrative doesn't justify it, and nothing we've learned up to this point would suggest that what's being shown here should even exist. Why is Alt being depicted as a giant? Why is she talking like an emotionless robot? I will create a construct of you, then disentangle your neural network from Johnny's. Because she is an emotionless robot. No, she isn't. It's Alt. We've seen her before. It's exactly Alt in the same way the Anne Grimm stuck in our heads is exactly Johnny Silverhand. The way she's being depicted here just begs the assumption that the writers really wanted this moment to be a big moment so that they could put their own perspectives on the narrative here and have it be canon. And what do I mean by that? The narrative, in part, is about the meaning of what it is to be human. If you take all of what you are to an exact degree and transfer into another vessel or body, is it still you? Is the ship of Theseus, dismantled into component parts and reassembled, still the same ship? We are pioneers, the first to ever separate mentally conjoined twins. That's one of the questions this game throws at the player. Normally, this can be an interesting discussion. It could serve as a strong moral dilemma for the player in certain situations. For example, when I help this vending machine named Schism with his view of the world and he reacts positively, is he actually feeling positive emotions? Or are complicated algorithms interacting with his hardware to produce the most likely response from what's occurring in front of him? If the latter, is there any moral downside to not helping him? And then there's the flip side of that conundrum. If an entity's reaction to certain things being measurable and reverse engineerable, such as with a computer's reaction to certain pieces of data, constitutes what can be considered something not having free will and not experiencing life in actuality, but just simulating likely responses to life, then can we apply that logic to anything in existence? 
to everything in existence, even a human. I actually am one of those people who don't believe that there is anything supernatural about life. I don't believe in any God or souls or anything of that nature. And I do believe, despite the complexity of life, that everything a brain does can be reverse engineered. Every decision a brain makes theoretically could be measured. I mean, the language I'm using right now, the same language you can understand, isn't a language we chose to learn. You absorbed it as information as an infant and a young child, and you absorb it now. But maybe you think that doesn't apply to you if you learned English as a second language, so let's go over that. If you think you did choose to learn it as a second or third or fourth language, why? Did you learn it because you thought English sounds nice? Why did you think it sounds nice? Did you choose to feel that? Or did you choose to learn it because it's a popular language and it would be smart to study it? Well, why is it a popular language? Did you choose for it to be popular? Did you choose for its popularity as a global language to matter to you? The answer to all of these questions is no, you didn't choose for these factors to be as they are, and in the same way, you didn't choose your response to said factors. The way you measure all of those factors is through your brain, which can only act in accordance with its own capabilities, which are in part decided by its experiences. Now, a lot of people struggle with this way of thinking, primarily because they see themselves as an active intermediary between the factors at play and the way said factors are digested as information. They believe that somewhere between the highly evolved instrument that is their brain receiving info and then responding to it, they respond to it. You see, people think they are a they, a something separate from their brain and their arm and their left arm and their legs and their body in general, almost as though they are not as their physical form is represented, as though they are something greater using their body as a vehicle to exercise their own will. If you have this conversation at a dinner table, for whatever reason, I don't recommend it, Many people who haven't given this philosophy much thought or simply don't care to think with much depth on it will look at those previous questions and respond with something like, no, I didn't choose to learn English as a baby, but I can choose to learn another language. Or, well, actually, I did learn to speak English on my own accord because I didn't need to learn it in my home country. As though these answers in any way contradict or even relate to the question of free will that's been put in front of them. They've made decisions before, and so that must mean they have free will, and that's as far as they can manage to dig into the problem. A really simple way to see this phenomenon is to ask someone to raise their right or left hand. Whichever hand they choose to raise is an example of something that would have always have been. If under those exact circumstances, and under the very minimal duress that is that exact question, their brain reacted by raising one of those hands, they would have always raised that exact hand. If you move back in time and introduce those exact variables to an exactly accurate degree to that person, they will make that same decision every time. And since we are always going to make one decision under any given set of circumstances, then those decisions are no true decisions. In effect, we have no free will of our own. We just react the only way we can to the moment we're in. But if you tell that to the same person who has their right or left hand up, and that person really doesn't like the idea of not being a prime decision maker in everything that happens in their life, they might show signs of a lack of depth. That is the phenomenon we're talking about here. In one instance, you might get someone who says, well, ask me that question again in the same way, obviously preparing to raise the other hand as though that would disprove the philosophy, not recognizing the faults in that logic. But some might not even go that far and will just say, well, I could have raised my other hand though. Some people who know what the subject of conversation is preemptively will raise both hands or do like a little juke with both hands chaotically because they think that sort of movement contradicts and therefore disproves the idea that they don't have the free will to do anything else in that moment. And yes, some people will think about it and either accept it or just move on without a care in the world. The point is that the questions suggest that through every decision you make, there's a near infinite number of factors at play that you don't have control over that make up the whole of what your decision is. Therefore, you really don't have a true decision to make. It was always made for you. And if those decisions that you have no control over are theoretically reverse engineerable and measurable, again, because they are dictated by the way your brain physically reacts to information, like how a CPU interacts with instructions, for example, the differences between humans and computers isn't actually one of functionality, but of complexity. That is to say, where our complex system of highly evolved levers and pulleys that make up our brains have evolved via sending instructions, our DNA, to our offspring in the long marathon we call life, the computer systems of today use comparatively simple algorithms to evolve themselves at paces that are limited by our ability to dictate them. Basically, I think that it's arguable that the difference between humans and computers is a matter of the universe having a method of evolution that is more effective than the algorithms we can write. And I think that in the same way a CPU doesn't get to choose the way it handles data, we don't get to choose the way we react to the environment around us, and therefore don't have any choice but the one we make in any given situation.
In the case of that latter point, I don't think it's even debatable. I think it's just a matter of recognizing the way things are, no matter how uncomfortable or personally attacked it makes you feel. Now, all of the words that just came out of my mouth aren't lies, I really do believe them, but I haven't said them for their own sake. There's a huge percentage of people watching this video who are extremely upset or find what I said stupid or were so personally offended and bothered that they stopped watching the video altogether. And that is the power that this subject has over people. And through Alt Cunningham is a power that CDPR has completely wasted through this one line. Your consciousness, neural engrams, will be recorded as data. The rest will cease to exist. The rest? The soul. I did not grant the program its name, but Soul Killer does precisely what it promises to do. Christ, I don't want to listen to this bullshit. Unless we're supposed to believe Alt is making shit up or lying, this basically identifies the developer's take on what is and isn't in Cyberpunk 2077 and explains why they chose to depict Alt as a pseudo-god. I mean, there is some lore suggesting that her emotions were broken up and scattered across the net, so that explains why she's so emotionless, but giant-like? Moving her arms out like Nocturna? The developers want her to be an infallible goddess because they want her line regarding souls to be indisputable in canon. I don't dislike this because I disagree with it. I dislike it because it's giving away too much too early. There is still a lot to do in 2077 once you reach this point, but Alt effectively handing us the answers to Soul Killer's function. And I do realize it's in the name, but how could any player know for sure without confirmation from a god, right? Alt handing us this answer douses a lot of the flame the rest of the game might have had from a narrative perspective. Is Saburo Arasaka still actually alive after uploading himself to Yorinobu, or is he just data? Is helping the schism vending machine actually making him happy, or is he just simulating the function of something or someone that would be happy in that situation. Well, now we know the answers. It's all smoke and mirrors. When someone uploads themselves into a computer host, they are only killing themselves and replacing their exact likeness with the computer, but without the soul. I actually don't think that this is a sign of bad writing. I think writers answering difficult questions is often stronger than writers asking questions, but being unable to answer them. Hello. <laughs> is that change in mic quality kind of strange? Was that jarring? I've it's me from the future. I needed to edit in a line because I, I fucked I fucked another line up a little too much. It wouldn't have made sense, but I'm trying to like throw it in now. And it's so jarring going from the mic quality because the thing is, OK, I had my gain set to like zero and I had artificially pumped up the gain through software and I hadn't realized that like on all of my videos, I just had zero gain on my mic. So it sounded awful. That's why my audio quality is so shit. Um, but now I'm trying to like put in the line and it goes from like a really bad quality to just like so much better <laughs> that I it it's still jar I guess I'm just going to throw this line in here as an explanation. I can't even remember what the context of the line was now. I think I'm talking about how writers. OK, yeah, so some writers will just not like take a position. They'll just ask questions and then some writers will ask questions and then answer them. I think that's pretty strong writing and I'm just going to throw this in there and then chop it down in editing, I guess. This is making it worse. I think I'll just stop. In this case, the execution could have been better. Reveal this information much later or make it harder to find if you really want it to be canon. Because as it stands, Alt telling us that there is such a thing as a soul and that it gets removed from a human upon engram copy and transfer has extreme implications regarding not just Saburo and all the AI we interact with in the game, but also to our decisions we make later on the space station. I don't know about you, but I didn't choose to have Vika copied into Arasaka property at the tail end of his life. Soma still has its impression left on me, and I knew even before Alt Revelation that I wouldn't want a duplicate form of me masquerading around with my loved ones and friends as though it were actually me, and so I wouldn't put that on V. Maybe that point is a little too nitpicky. They did have to reveal that info at some point, and there is enough stipulation on bad memories and fallible AI for you to safely assume that Alt might not know for sure what she's talking about with the human soul anyway. But my interpretation was that she wasn't making it up and learned through being in the net that she definitely lost something of her humanity being uploaded and split from her body. All the same, any semblance of depth the game might have had with its philosophies are, for me, dumbed down significantly with Alt's revelation. I think between her being depicted as what a human would assume a god looks like and her being written to be this emotionless, um, source of accurate information suggests that the devs really do want what she says to be canon, and that's enough for me. Her depiction was designed to be godlike on the surface, her actor was instructed to give a performance that can only be justified through extraneous lore, and the information she gives tosses the game up on a platter for any player who's half paying attention. 
It's all surface level. It lacks depth. Let's talk about the romance interests. There are actually four romance options that I'm aware of in Cyberpunk 2077, but I only interacted with one and a half, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Judy is the gal you meet when you're first doing the brain dance to find info on Yorinobu's site. Sweet. Shit. Judy is the gal you meet when you're first doing the brain dance to find info on Yorinobu's suite and is friends with Evelyn. She's smart, has highly technical hobbies, is employed, and has the emotional intelligence you'd expect from a woman of her age. Pan Am Palmer, on the other hand, has none of that shit going for her. She's good with cars and has like one other asset on her side. That's it. She's childish, needy, selfish, like very self-involved, Pan Am. She was absolutely written to appeal to either high school boys who don't really know much else by way of romance or grown men who like women to be very childish. So if you prefer Pan Am over Judy, you need to go to jail. There's honestly no comparison and I barely interacted with the romance options on my playthroughs. Judy is just infinitely better. Walking around with Pan Am during those introductory missions serves to show the player that she's willing to literally pout like a child when she doesn't get her way. I mean, the first time you meet her, she's throwing a hissy fit because Rogue isn't giving her exactly what she wants. The interactions she has with the guys from her clan <laughs> give the impression that she's the one who got passed around between a good majority of them, like a blunt between good friends. I can't confirm, just saying. That's the impression I get with her. And the clan boys. Hell, even guys who she doesn't know. Yeah, Pan Am is kind of an attention whore, and using my personal experience with people like that, she's probably a whore whore, too. If that's what you're into, fine. But have you considered Judy? Remember what I said about her being employed? <laughs> what does Pan Am do for money out there in the Mad Max disgusting desert? Sell scraps of what? Vehicles? Her body? Judy's even useful from a gameplay perspective. She basically plans and directs the entire rescue mission for Evelyn, right? Don't be a child who chooses a gal like Pan Am. Be an adult who prefers a woman like Judy who's intelligent, resourceful, employed, and has the emotional wherewithal to talk about what she's feeling instead of playing the silent game when things don't go her way. I didn't interact with any of the other romances in the game. I'm sure they're all fine. Judy all the way. In keeping with the theme of Cyberpunk 2077 being a mixed bag, the exciting boss fights leave the player's imagination running wild with possibilities on a first encounter and stop there. CDPR introduced cool areas to fight certain bosses, and gave them unique personalities represented in their characters and fighting styles, but all of that is very obviously hindered by their AI and the gameplay loop required in fighting them. Mag dump, sprint around in a circle, mag dump. In instances where your opponent has high mobility, such as the fight against Oda, this issue is countered quite a bit, but is still easily circumnavigated by just spending a little more time preemptively running halfway through a mag. The dude is very well designed, terrifying the first time you fight him, actually. The fight itself is fun, it's just a shame this sort of fun is anchored by what can only be described as the AI not being given the tools to predict your movement, resulting in a chase me in circles kind of fight. If you don't remember that being the case, do you remember the fight against Sasquatch? The fact that she uses melee only served to highlight this issue, although I guess this argument really goes down the drain when you're using melee only. Uh, but does it really? This is also true for the fight against Adam Smasher. Because the AI clearly has trouble navigating the arena in an intuitive way, the fight against Smasher, for me, turned into a race around the staircase where I bait him into an attack, mag dump, then run around these stairs and repeat. The second half of the fight forced me into a slightly different strategy momentarily, but ultimately couldn't change the fact that after dispatching Adam's goons, the best strategy was to just run him around. Adam wasn't necessarily a cakewalk, but the real bitch was not falling asleep halfway through the fight. The boss fights are cool. They're generally pretty fun, you know, because they include the gameplay and mobility mechanics inherent to 2077, which are excellent. This is doubly true if you have the crafted weapons necessary to blow through them, but they suffer from a very video gamey problem of not being able to challenge the player due to their pathing and inability to adapt to player behavior. Just an unfortunate fact, whether or not that actually bothers some people is going to change from person to person. The boss fight leads to your ultimate game ending, which in my case, Savi convinced Yoronobu to let his father uh, overwrite his mind, leading to the revival of Saburo Arasaka, and according to Alt, makes the effective dictator of the world an AI with no soul. Uh, I'll be honest, I only did this because I thought working in tandem with the princess's wishes would, um, would let me... Uh, I wanted to sleep with the princess. Uh, didn't happen, very upset, but moving on. We're gonna wrap this video up by discussing what happened on that there space station. That Arasaka space station, mind you. Remember at the beginning of the video when we discussed that Frankfurt leak that we were trying to cover up? Supposedly that leak had something to do with Arasaka using their bases in space to develop weapons again. In space. The idea being that if they obtain a militaristic and absolute presence in space, none of their rivals or enemies in general will be able to lift a finger against them. 
Strictly speaking, this isn't legal, and the Frankfurt leak stood to make the European Space Council vote to take away Arasaka's right to develop bases in space. Just a neat little tidbit of info. I'm not sure to what degree that bit about the weapons is correct, but judging from what I gathered in-game, and some of the more anecdotal evidence I gathered from doing very basic research, it seems both plausible and most likely that this space station V finds himself in at the end of the game, or at least one like it, is housing illegal weapons being developed for Arasaka Might. I'm not sure why I'm even talking about this, I just think that, uh, in a way, the story is ending where it began. The Frankfurt leak was concerned with Arasaka's space rights, and now we find ourselves in a station that we were working to keep legal at the beginning of the game. In any case, V's mind is absolutely blanked. The doctor slash scientist on the station makes a note that the relic has been removed from V's head and that Johnny is no more. We get some more references to the underlying question of the game in regards to what makes a human a human, and we're promptly moved to V's living quarters. On the way, the guard escorting us says something that I haven't been able to shake since playing the game. When in Kyoto, I hear the cuckoo calling and long for Kyoto. Huh? The guard quotes a famous haiku from Matsuo Basho. I've done a little searching around to understand the context of this poem, but from what I gathered, unless you speak Japanese and read the original, you're going to be working off of someone else's interpretation. Even among the translations in just English, you can find hundreds of different versions. Luckily, we don't have to find the most accurate translation. We can just use cyberpunks for what it is. And what it is, for me, is a little complex. Remember that what I'm about to say is pure opinion with regards to what this line makes me feel and makes me think about as it pertains to V's situation. First, the poem seems to be alluding to the very human experience of desires never quite being met. To be in the place that you want to be only to have some reminder of what that place is and feeling that you want that place to be more. The Kyoto in reality is not the Kyoto in Basho's mind, perhaps, and in V's case, the sense of self he so desired throughout the entire game, separate from Johnny, comes at such a cost that there truly was no victory for him at all. While in a state of self, separate from any other entity, V sees the cost of his so-called repair, visions of purple, physical sickness, and a constant state of confusion as the new neural pathways take root. It is here, in that state of self, that V longs for a state of self. My attention, for some reason, is brought to the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, clearly the words in the name are probably the only similarity they share in reality, but bear with me here. In the film, prisoner Randall McMurphy attempts to find a sense of freedom outside of his sentence by feigning his way into the facilities used to treat the mentally unwell. In doing so, he eventually finds his way into a place much, much worse than what his previous predicament had him placed in. Once he found the extra freedom he so desired, he realized that what he longed for was his prison once again, but all too late. I'm not sure why I included that thought, it probably isn't related at all, but this is just what the inclusion of Matsuo Basho's poem made me think of. I think it serves to remind both that what you want is not always what is or will be, and there are always things that are much worse than what are. V, for instance, trying to escape the claustrophobic hellhole that is a wealthless night city life, finds himself eventually imprisoned within his own mind, an arguably tighter fit altogether, especially between two subjects. Where still is when his mind is possibly not occupied with any one whole subject at all, which is where we find ourselves in the space station. V lies back after hallucinating a strange confrontation with the voice of Johnny, beckoning him to his whereabouts. The TV plays the report of some newscaster or another detailing the revival of Saburo Arasaka through Yonorobu's surrender that we helped to facilitate. It is at this point that most players will realize that they've been upon Saburo's improvised plan all the while. The reporter stands and states, Today, technology has fulfilled the promise left empty by religion. Depending on the amount of respect you hand to CDPR, this line is either on the nose cringe or intentionally simple for the sake of exemplifying the surface level thinking of those inhabiting the world of 2077. You can guess which side of that fence I'm on, but assuming it's the latter, which it might be, it goes to show the self-serving philosophy present in 2077 throughout Night City, and probably the world, which follows something like, um, does this spiritual philosophy grant me eternal life? No, then it doesn't serve me. This is to say nothing of the fact that many of the religions of the world today don't offer any um, guarantee of eternal life to begin with. There's also an uproar among the proletariat as they see the transfer of consciousness as something that only further separates the divide between the classes and elites of power, and to a whole new degree. Part of me believes if the price of the relic and its functionality was low enough to be considered easily accessible, then people would be protesting the fact that it isn't free instead of protesting its existence at all. After all, the right to life should be guaranteed insofar as it can be reasonably maintained, right? The tests with the scientist, whose voice actor was apparently instructed to be as rage-inducing as possible, continue, 
They go on, uh, they are repetitive in nature, and CDPR has to be wholly commended for capturing the absolute dread that V feels in this spaceship while undergoing the uh, trials, so to speak. The quick snapping from day to day, moment to moment, and test to test made me feel so upset and my intentions completely unheard and uncared for, which I can only assume were the same feelings uh, V had, if only stronger. After the tests were visited by one Anders Hellman, the same guy we kidnapped for the sake of learning how to save ourselves from the relic, he states that V has six months to live. His life, ultimately, couldn't be saved by removing the relic. The only option to retain our lives is to send up for Arasaka's Secure Your Soul program, a service that's just begun, which uploads the consciousness of its users to a database, which is then saved until a later date, when said consciousness can be uploaded to a compatible body. It is amusing to me that the same program which uses a technology dubbed Soul Killer is now being branded as a Secure Your Soul service, but that's advertising for you. I've already mentioned that I didn't choose to sign the contract Hellman puts in front of us. I believe when all is said and done, the person that V would believe himself to be in the future after being uploaded into another body wouldn't be V. I think this would be theoretically true in reality with all of the same tech, and I know it to be true in the game thanks to Alt Revelation earlier. Um, the soul, as it were, would be lost. The result would be a thing resembling a human masquerading around as V. All of his loved ones, all of his friends would be helpless to recognize that the thing in front of them was a smokescreen, a mirage. Like I've said, the idea that there could be some puppet of a thing out there pretending to be me strikes fear right into my heart, and I would absolutely rather die than allow that to ever become a reality. At least I would do my best to prevent it, even if I'm not ultimately in control of uh, whether or not that comes to fruition through some corporation or another. Since I wouldn't want that for me, I didn't want that for V. Maybe some of you disagree. I should say as a parting glass that the voice acting on the space station, at least by the male V, was absolutely incredible. In those moments of low, tired questions and confusion, I felt the voice actor Gavin Drea was pulled into his element and made each moment's emotional draw multiply many times over. Great performance all around. Cyberpunk 2077 is an accomplishment of risk-taking. CDPR has earned my respect in attempting something so outlandish and frankly out of their element. With so many moving pieces, so many players, and so many philosophies at hand, this game had the potential to become one of the greatest of all time. And while I can understand that many people will have an extreme love for this game thanks to the boundaries it pushes and commentary it provides on life itself, I felt that the delivery, the execution, and the all too often on the nose discussions in the game's most important topics uh, detracts from all of its strengths. Remember, I'm not sure for what purpose 2077 rolls around in its more satirical nature, but I don't think it's strictly to sure up the game's quality. I think it's because the more you try to take the game seriously at times, the more the weaknesses in the writing show. Despite this, I can't help but like the game. Even accounting for its embarrassing launch quality, the development CDPR has put into the game since then, along with what the game is in a vacuum, means that I have no choice but to have great respect for the work that went into it and the final product that it ultimately represents. Cyberpunk 2077 is a risk-taking, innovative, and optimistic attempt at creating a real work of art that would stand to live through the test of time. Unfortunately, I don't think the game is strong enough, consistently enough, to live up to the apparent hope CDPR placed into it. A very, very good game that fell short of the extremely high standards it placed on itself. 2077, CDPR, I have nothing but respect for you. Good luck, have fun.